Glad you're here. Welcome to worship. Um, Bill and Brian Cole, uh, they're in Burlington this morning. Bill Benz and Brian Cole. Uh, we have a commission that is over at Westminster Presbyterian, and that church is coming from the PCUSA into the EPC, and um, our commission will be welcoming them, commissioning their session this morning and their pastor, and welcoming them into our denomination. So I want you to keep Bill and all of that team in your prayers. Uh, a few announcements as we begin. The uh, Well, first, I want to pass this around. Uh, so I'll start with Rich. If there is a slot on there you can fill in, that would be great. Um, there's several openings, as you can see, on the fellowship and cleaning chart. We're still collecting uh, things for Means Kentucky. Uh, the school supplies, we'll plan to send those towards the end of the month uh, to them, probably the last week of the month. Our deadline is supposed to be next Sunday, but uh, get them in as quickly as you can if you'd like to participate. And uh, the Raleigh Rescue Mission items have changed since uh, last week for August. Uh, they are in need of paper products. And so napkins, paper plates, I've listed some things there. Any type of paper products they are in need of. So if you can help with that, that would be great. <coughs> Session meets next uh, Sunday right after Sunday school at noon. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention was 4S. You've seen it in the connection. And uh, it stands for Second Sunday Supper and Study. Uh, starting in September on the second Sunday night, we will have supper at 6, and then we will begin, and we're going to study Hebrews. And uh, so that's where the 4S comes from. So if you see 4S around, that's what it means. And we'll probably ask you uh, the week before, I'll send around kind of a sheet, and if you plan to be there, uh, to sign up so we know how much food to prepare for. Uh, but if you didn't sign up and you decide on the second Sunday afternoon that you want to come, come because there will be plenty of food, I promise you. Suku has an announcement that she wants to share. Just a brief announcement. We'll be starting Bible study again in September, starting on the ooh, 12th, I think, it's a Tuesday, going through to the 15th of October. And if there is interest, we will do it both at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 7 in the evening on Tuesdays. Please let me know whether you can come. I'll be blessed if I have to teach both morning and evening. So it's no difficulty for me, but I need at least one other person if I'm going to teach <laughs> in the morning or evening. <laughs> Thank you. If you um, have yeah. never sat under Suku's teaching, uh, you've missed something. So um, it's for women and women only. And so she didn't say that, but she usually says that. But if you would like to participate or have friends or family or co-workers or people Anybody. out in the community, invite them uh, on 10 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, 7 o'clock, right? 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. Any other announcements that you have? Uh, blood drive, what is that? The blood drive was originally scheduled for August 27th. We've got about 15, I think, of our congregational members that have signed up. Um, Kathy has been next door on both ends and have had some commitments from those people. Um, right now, we're pushing that into September. Uh, the date has not yet been set. The 27th, Kathy was going to be gone, and the director that was going to be here supervising that is going to be gone, so we had to move that date. So as soon as Kathy gets a date from the Red Cross, then we will share that with you so you can put it on your calendar. And there was a little bit of talk about Al Floyd doing a meal. Kathy was talking to him, so I, we, we're still in that uh, talking stage, but we may share a meal with those that come and invite people to come and eat and be in, in fellowship. So we're glad you're here this morning, and uh, we have come to worship God. I'm going to invite you to stand and listen to this call to worship that comes from Psalm 146, the first two verses. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live, and I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Isn't that a great verse? That we will praise God as long as we have our being. Meaning, as long as we're alive, we're going to praise God. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Join us as we begin to worship with our God's sakes.
as you remain seated, eternal God whose power upholds.
your Bibles, um, whether it's in electronic form or hard copy, I would invite you to turn to Genesis. We are still in our series on foundations. Today we pick up on the second section that begins in chapter 12. I'm going to read the first nine verses. Uh, we'll be talking about all of chapter 12 in just a moment, but I want to share these first nine verses with you. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moriah. Now the Canaanites was there in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to go to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched a tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And he called upon the Lord's name. Abram journeyed on, continued to Nagba. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. George Bernard Shaw has said that if other planets are inhabited, they must be using the earth as their insane asylum. <laughs> now while that is funny, it is also sad. Because it seems to me that the earth, the world, the people of our nation, the world, is, they're just not getting any better. Things seem to be getting worse. Last week, we talked about the first 11 chapters and this section that began, Genesis. And someone has said that this could be called the divine disappointments, these first 11 chapters. These 11 chapters are broken up into four sections. The first is creation. God created everything, all things, created man, and he called it good. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Secondly, the fall came. Satan came into play. Man's evil nature, this fallen nature that we have, came upon us. And the scripture says that man began to think all things evil continually. How sad that is. That God would even say, I'm sorry I created man. And that led to the flood. He found one righteous man, Noah. And through Noah and his line, he continued humanity. In his descendants, Sham, Ham, and Jephthah, the world was populated. And God told them to go and fill the earth. And last week, I preached on the Tower of Babel, and I reminded you that they had disobeyed God. They had not done what God had called them to do. They were trying to make a name for themselves. They were trying to lift themselves up. They were not keeping their eye on God. They tried to stay together. They had one language and were in unity. And God came down and he confused their language. He sent them out. It says God spread them as he had commanded them all over the earth. Now we know that Ham's uh, descendants settled in and around Egypt and in that area, Jephthah's descendants 
uh, were the descendants of the Gentiles, and we know that Shan's descendants came into Abram and the descendants of Abram. We begin now with this section. This chapter 12 begins this promise of a nation. And that's going to be the title of this sermon. The sermon will be broken down into three sections, the call, the promise, and the journey. And we need to understand that with chapter 12 of Genesis, we start to see the restoration of Eden. We see God begin the restoration of Eden. Now that restoration will not be complete until Christ returns. But it is starting now with a man called Abram. A man that God calls out. And in these first nine verses, we hear this promise of a nation. God begins to work through individuals. And I want to show you that in, in just a little bit. How God begins to work through individuals. So first is the call. God came to Abram. Abram was born in 2166 B.C. He lived, grew up in Ur of the Chaldeans. And uh, it was there around where the Tigris and the Euphrates meet that he was born and grew up. He was a herder. His family had you know, goats and cows and, and all of that. And um, His father, at one point in time, uh, Terah, moved the family to Haran. Now, Terah was also the family of Sarai. And that might sound familiar, that's Abram and Sarai. Sarai was Abram's wife. But Terah was the father of Abram and Sarah. They had different mothers, but she was his half-sister. And that comes into play in the scripture. And so they move to Haran, and God comes to Abram. It doesn't say, the scripture doesn't tell us why God chose this man, Abram. All it says is God came to Abram and he called him by name. He called him by name. And so Abram was 75 at the time that God came and called him. The world had devolved, as we'll see as we go through Genesis, into uh, utter chaos. Paul, in his letter to Rome, in the first chapter, gives a description of how the world was viewed. And I want you to hear this passage of what was going on, how the world had devolved to evil very quickly after God had flooded the earth. Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness but cause that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them, evident to them. for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what had been made so that they were without excuse. In other words, everyone knew they were without excuse. For even though they knew God, they had not honored Him as God and had given thanks to Him. But they became brutal in their speculations and their foolishness in their heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, exchanging glory for incorruptibility. Uh, of God's image, they formed corruptible man of birds and footed uh, animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to lust of their hearts, of impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature instead of the Creator, who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged natural functions for, 
for that which was unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of, with women and burned in their desires towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to deprived minds, to those things which were not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They all gossiped, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God, ordinances of God, that they chose to practice such things were worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they gave heartily approval to all those who practice these things. This is the earth that had fallen into evil. And God comes to a man named Abram, and he calls him out. When God calls you, he calls you out from darkness into light. He calls you from one place where you have been to another. When God calls you, you cannot remain in the same place. He calls Abram. He says, go, and I will show you a land. He doesn't tell him where he's going yet. He just says, go, and Abram cannot stay where he's at. It is the same with us. When God calls us, and my guess is this, either all of you have been called or God is calling you or you wouldn't be here in worship today. And so God is calling you to leave a life or has called you to leave a life. And we've read all that the world says is good. It says that man approved of these actions. Immorality, gossip, lies, and the list is endless. But you can't continue the old life when God calls you out. So in the call... You leave one place to find another. I ran for 17 years. I had a call, and I won't go through my call, but at 15, I was called by God, and for 17 years, I ran from that call. At age 32, 23 years ago, you can do the numbers, I'm 55. <laughs> at 32, I answered that call. Um, I had a a great job, uh, a great income, um, had a lot of possessions, a house that I owned, and I sold the house, I sold most of my possessions. I left the town and people and family that I loved and were close to. I left a church that I loved, and God said, go. Now, God may not call you to sell what you have or to go some other place, but when God calls you, you can't remain in the same place. Because what you will do is keep your eyes on the past and what you have accumulated or things that you have instead of focusing on God. When you leave that place, then God calls. As he calls you, you can focus on him and what he calls you to do. Secondly, God not only called Abram, but he gave Abram a promise. Listen to the promise. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This is the promise that God makes to Abram. What a great promise. Faith is not based on feelings. Now, emotions come into play with us as we come to faith in Jesus Christ very often. But 
the feelings is not what saves us. In fact, true faith is through the Word of God. The Scripture says that God came to Abram, He called him by name, and He gave him a promise. God is speaking just like He spoke in creation. He is speaking to Abram. God makes the promise. And if you not, don't hear anything else this morning, you need to hear this. We are not saved by making promises to God. We are saved by believing the promises God made to us. We are not made or saved by making promises to God. We are saved by believing the promises God made to us. For all who believe, will have eternal life. And what is it that we're to believe is in His life, death, and resurrection, His Son, Jesus Christ. We come to that saving knowledge of who He is. God makes the promises. He tells Abram, I will show you. I will make you. I will bless you. This is God making the promises to Abram. And when God makes a promise, He's going to fulfill it. Because if God didn't follow through with His promises, He would cease to be God, and that can't happen. So if God makes a promise, if He makes a covenant, if He makes a commitment to His people, then God's going to follow through. There's an interesting statement, intriguing statement that God makes to Abram in this promise. He tells Abram this. He says, and so you shall be a blessing. So you shall be a blessing. When God makes this promise to us, and we come and answer the call, and we listen to this promise that He makes, He promises not only to bless us. Now, I know that in this walk with God, sometimes things happen, we have these ups and downs, but God walks with us. And He fulfills His promise to be with us and never forsake us. But He also uses you to bless others. He causes you to be a blessing as you live into the promise that He has given you. Several years ago, our youth and uh, Karen Cole and our youth went to Means, Kentucky. They participated in an EPC mission project there uh, with other youth groups from around the nation. They came back and they were so excited. They had a servanthood ministry. They had helped these people uh, that needed help, um, you know, doing roofs and building and all of that. And they were just so excited that God had used them to bless someone else. And we started thinking, how can we uh, expand on that? And so um, we came up with the idea of what it would look like maybe to have a VBS in Means, Kentucky. Karen called Gail the, at Project Worth and said, you know, would this work? And she began to work on that, that aspect. Terry began to work on how a structure of a VBS in that area, in that situation would look. And we were excited because we believed that God would use us in some way to bless the people and especially in this situation, the kids of Means, Kentucky. So some adults and a lot of our youth and kids went, and for a week we spent with these kids. And I can tell you that um, I believe that God used us to bless them. They heard the gospel. We prayed together, played together, fellowshiped together. We fed them. We nurtured them, and it was hard to say goodbye. But God had called, called us to live into the promise that I'll use you to bless other people. On the way back that week, at the end of the week, to Raleigh, my son David said, this was absolutely the best week of my life. So God had not only 
used us to bless others in sharing his good news of who he was. But God in turn poured out his blessings on us in return. When God calls and he makes that promise in your life, he promises to pour out a blessing from heaven that can't even be contained. And as you live into that promise and that call, God will bless other people through you if you're faithful and obedient. And that leads us to this third point. Finally, the journey. Abram, he, um, you can see on the map, Abram had grown up down on the bottom right in Ur. His father had taken him, Terah, to Haran, which is the top there on the screen. They had lived there. His father had died there. It is there that God came to Abram and made the call and the promise. And he called Abram to go forth, to go to the land in which I will show you. And he led him down to Canaan, the promised land, the land that God will give to the inheritance. He is calling a nation out of Abram. And Abram was faithful. Abram was obedient. And he traveled down with his family, with his nephew Lot, with all that he had, his wife Sarah. And he went down and he arrived in Shechem. And the scripture says that he built an altar there and gave thanks to God. He traveled from Shechem over to Bethel, and there on the mountain between Ai and Bethel, he built another altar. And it says he gave thanks to God, the Lord God, for calling on him. God had a conversation with Abram seven times, as recorded in Genesis. This was the first as we have here in chapter 12. And so... Abram had been faithful on this journey. We often, as we think about James or we think about Hebrews, where the writers tell us Father Abraham was faithful, he was obedient, and he was. But you've got to understand that, that Abraham actually early on failed some. Just as the nation that God called out had fallen and failed. And over and over again, they found in captivity, they found themselves wandering, and God would bring them back. You see, God would use a person now to guide his people, this nation that he would call out. And so Abram took his eyes off of God. He went down because of the famine to Egypt. He took his wife with him. Sarah had to be a beautiful lady. I mean, she's now 75 plus. And as they're going into Egypt, he says, Hey, honey, you are so beautiful. I am so afraid that the people in Egypt, the leaders are going to look at you and see how beautiful you are, and they're going to kill me and take you for their own. So I'll tell you what, why don't you just say you're my sister? Now, that was a half-truth. She was his half-sister. But she was his wife, and he had told her to lie about that. And so Pharaoh is certainly struck by Sarah's beauty, and he wants to take her to himself. But God, it says, struck Pharaoh and said, whoa, wait a minute. He brought Abram before him and said, why don't you tell me that this was your wife instead of your sister? Take all you have and leave. What did Abram do in Canaan? Abram built an altar to the Lord and he worshipped the Lord and he gave thanks to the Lord in Shechem and in Bethel. But Abram took his eyes off of God. He wanted food for his family and didn't trust God to provide it. And he went to Egypt and he had his wife lie. And he didn't learn his lesson. When you get, we get to chapter 20 in this book, we'll see that he went before King Abimelech and did the same thing with Sarah, asking her to be his sister instead of his wife. But that is true of the nation that God called out. They failed God over and over again. 
And God, through people, through men, through individuals now, compared to the way he had operated before, he is now calling out Abram. He, in bringing his nation back to him, calls out the prophets. He has kings. There are judges. And ultimately, we come to Jesus Christ, who in a Savior gives his life to save the world. And after Christ's ascension, God uses individuals to call his people, his chosen, those who he will save to him. This is the God that we serve. We're on this journey with God, you and I. The problem is this, commitment. You see, we live in a world that has now done away with commitment, and we talk about the temporary. Everything is temporary. I will stay on my job as long as I like it, or it works for me. Commitment has gone by the wayside. Commitment in marriage, commitment to one another, even commitment to family we see has gone by the wayside. It's become a society again that says, I want to do it my way. It's about me. It's not about you or anything else. We turn our eyes, as Abram did, off of God, and it turns back to us. And folks, it's no different in the church or among Christians. The divorce rate among Christians is no different than that in society. The commitment level in our churches around our nation is not there. About 70 some percent today in our nation claim to know God or profess a relationship with God. About 38 to 40 percent of those say that they attend church but less than 20% of professing Christians attend church on any given Sunday. If something better comes up, I'll do that. The commitment level is not there. And just as an aside, only 12% of all Christians, professing Christians, claim to be evangelical. The commitment level to Sunday school, to worship, to teaching, to ministry, to being involved in ministry, to attending the ministry of the church. If something better comes along, I'll do that. And I'm not going to just rail on the pews, the people in the pews. Listen to this. 60% of all pastors within their first five years of ministry lead the pastorate. 60% within the first five years lead the pastorate. That's sad. If they truly had a call on their life and they've taken their eyes off of God and they forego that commitment, God's call on their life. We live in a world that says temporary is good. Just do what makes you happy. I've shared with a few of you before when I was in Wilmington and pastoring there, uh, a teenager, or it's not a teenager, a young adult in uh, my congregation came to me and asked me if I would officiate their wedding. And I said yes. And I didn't know the young man. I'd never met him before. We started counseling together, and I always require counseling. Uh, before marriage if I'm going to officiate the service. And so we had gone through these counseling sessions and we had gotten to the point where we were going to talk about the service and the vows. And the young man looked at me and he said, um, what about the vows? I said, well, what about them? He said, well, I don't want to say until death do us part. And I said, well, what do you want to say? He said, I want to say until I don't love her anymore. So I stopped and I said, you're going to have to find someone else to officiate your wedding. I'm not going to do that. And furthermore, I turned to the young girl and I said, Honey, look, 
you need to go home. You need to talk to this man. And y'all need to talk about this marriage. Because what he is saying he's going to commit to is not marriage. It's something else. But that's the mindset of our society. I'll just do something until I don't like it anymore. And I'll go and do something else. That's not what God has committed us to on this journey that He has called us to. God has called us to be faithful because He is faithful. He has called us to be obedient because He is obedient. He has made these promises to us and He will fulfill them. And His expectation on our life is that we will do the same. Father Abraham, we will see in chapter 22 had grown to such a commitment level that he was willing when God said, take your son and go sacrifice him. What did he do? He went. Where's our commitment level? To a God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, who loves us beyond measure. A God who makes that promise to you and me as he did with Abram. Go, and I will show you the way. This is the promise God has given us. He has called out a nation. A nation that is to be holy. A nation that is to worship him because he is worthy of our worship. God created us to praise Him and to enjoy Him forever. Eden will be, dis will be restored. God has made that promise. And one day, Christ will return and set this upside-down world right-side up again. But until that day, this is what God has called us to do. To live into the call. To believe His promises. And know that He will walk with you on your journey. Until that day of restoration or till He calls you home, He'll walk with you every step of the way. Isn't that an awesome God? Let's pray. Father God, thank You again for Your call and promise. We thank you, Lord, that you never forsake us. You never leave us. We pray, Lord, that as we walk with you through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will guide us, lead us in all things, in all ways. And for this, Lord, we give you thanks. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. When we come to this table, one of the things that we probably ought to be thankful for is the fact that God committed His Son Jesus Christ. And His Son Jesus Christ fulfilled the commitment laid on His life. Jesus was in the garden and He said, Lord, if it be Your will, take this cup from Me, but not My will, but Yours be done. Christ fulfill the commitment. When he was in the upper room, he had told his disciples as he broke the bread, this is my body broken for you. He lifted the cup and he said, this is the blood poured out for you and for many, that's us, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Christ fulfilled his commitment. He did die. His blood was shed. And we come to this table acknowledging that it is through His life, death, and resurrection that we are saved, that we are His. And God calls us to examine ourselves before we come to this table. He calls all believers. This is not Hope's table or a Presbyterian table. This is the table of the Lord. 
And he calls all who love him and who earnestly repent of his, their sins and desire to be in relationship with him to come and be fed. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your son Jesus Christ, for his life, his death, his resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for the institution of this Holy Supper. We thank you, Lord, for the broken body and the, bre the blood that was shed. For you have said, without the shedding of blood, there would be not any of remission of sins. Lord, you have called us to yourself. You have forgiven us of our sins. And Lord, you walk with us. As we come to this table today, Lord, nurture us, feed us, use us. Lord, may we be obedient in all things and all ways. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This we pray in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask Kathy Flaherty if she will come and serve with me this morning. And uh, when we're in place, we'll invite you to come. And I'm going to ask Al Floyd if he would come first. He'll be in the back for prayer. this morning. Um, I'm going to stop. If you have names you'd like to lift up, that'd be great. Uh, the Lord knows those situations. Uh, we're glad to have Bill Joyner with us. Um, he had surgery uh, this coming Tuesday to be two weeks ago, and uh, he is healing. We're thankful that God is healing him, and he's here. Um, Lynn's um, brother-in-law lost his mother, um, and we want to pray for the Guy family. Uh, Ken Guy is his mother. Uh, you know his daughter Katie. Katie and Stephen have been here before. Ken and Sharon are Katie's uh, parents. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Bill and Brian are in Burlington, and we want to play, pray for Westminster Church um, as they come into the EPC. And also, uh, Bill shared yesterday, um, some of you um, may know the Mullins family at Christ Church um, in uh, Florida, uh, Bill's daughter attends that church. Todd Mullins now uh, is the pastor of that church. And his wife, uh, they were vacationing in Colorado, and she had a biking accident, mountain biking accident. And uh, she's in critical condition in a hospital in Colorado. And um, Heather had asked that, knew that we were a praying congregation and wanted uh, us to pray for Todd's wife, Julie, is her name. So I want to pray for them. Uh, let's join in prayer. Father God, thank you again. Uh, just thank you so much for your promise in our life. We thank you, Lord, that you have called the church together as the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to answer prayers. We have seen within our own body of Christ called hope, Lord, answered prayers. Within our own congregation and those, Lord, that you have called us to pray for that we don't even know. So, Lord, we lift those up. We lift every situation up to you, Lord, knowing that you are still the great healer. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. Prayer is our communication with you, Lord, and you have blessed us with it. We pray, Lord, that now as these names are called forth, you know, every situation... Lord, that you would pour out blessings of healing or restoration or reconciliation. Maybe even those that are searching for jobs, Lord, or relationship problems or financial problems. Whatever it may be, you know, Lord, how to handle it. Listen to these names. Ted has asked prayers for his mom. We just pray, Lord, that you would just touch her, pray healing on her life. Lord, we pray for Gloria. We've been praying for Karen's friend for so long. And we just pray, Lord, that 
as we lift up her name, she would feel your presence right now as she deals with cancer. Lord, thank you again that you never forsake us, that you walk with us, that your Holy Spirit lives in us, that you fulfill every promise that you've given. And Lord, we look forward to that day, that day when Eden will be restored, the day that we can stand before you and you will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And Lord, we will be able to worship and praise your name forever and ever. Until that day, use us, guide us, and direct us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray all of this in your Son's name. Amen. We invite y'all to stand as we close our service. We're going to sing, I will follow.
We have been grafted in through Jesus Christ into his holy nation. This nation that he called through Abram, a nation of Israel, a nation that he had chosen and called to be his own. We are part of that nation. Isn't that neat? And he calls us to be a people who go out and be winsome and follow him and tell others about him. So they too can come and be a part of that nation that he has called through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the people we are. So go out in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and be that winsome people. And let the Holy Spirit use you as he sees fit. Amen. Amen. Amen.